<laughs> Not quite there yet, but it is beautiful. Only your hearts are as open as the these flowers. Please bow your hands in prayer. Dear Lord of judgment and of mercy, know us truly. When we hide ourselves in shame, you seek us out in love. Grant us the fulfillment of your forgiveness. Then as one people we may be united. In the name of prayer. Amen. Amen.
across the street are at major faith. I believe in the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered and conscious was crucified dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For the men he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Keep them both in your prayers. 
And, uh, well, I got a call yesterday from Richard Dobbs, who is uh, Kim Freer's friend, and he wanted me to pass a message along. He was very emotional, he called. Now, you, most of you know that Kim is, she's got advanced stage 4 cancer. It was a devastating diagnosis. She's been in a lot of pain. She's been in the hospital for weeks. She was just able to get out of the hospital. She's had radiation and she's going to endure chemo. Her prognosis is not good. And Richard called and he said, I want you to tell your folks there that we are grateful for the prayer because prayer works. Amen. He said, we've been seeing miracles. And he was very, very emotional and moved. He said, please tell your people to keep praying because prayer works. Prayer is a mystery. I don't know why God invites us to pray. And part of that mystery is God knows what we need before we ask for it. That God does not need me to initiate to respond, but He invites us to petition Him and to intercede on behalf of others. And I'll tell you this, I don't know what your prayer life is like. I'll tell you what mine is like. I don't pray enough. And so I want to remain faithful in all these things because we don't see as many miracles as we want to see, but God does have a plan. And so I would encourage you to just be a part of that because it does make a difference. I can't tell you how often I hear from somebody who says, you know, I feel the power of those prayers. So do not grow weary in prayer. So it's wonderful to see everybody here today. We are blessed in so many ways. And I know there's a lot of concerns. Let's, let's prepare our hearts. Let's have a moment of quiet meditation to prepare for prayer. Lord, it is so good to be in your presence and the serenity of this sanctuary. It is our desire to hear from you. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Guide us into all truth. Lord, break in where our hearts have been hardened that we might be sensitive to the need around us. And Lord, that our, that our hearts might be in concern for those who are in the midst of trials and suffering. Lord, I just thank you so much for this community here, for the laughter, for the joy, for the concern that your people have for one another. May this spread. May we see a revival break out across this land. Lord, we just want to lift up all the churches that surround us, regardless of their denomination. We pray for the leaders of the churches everywhere the gospel is preached, that it would be godly leadership. And Lord, that uh, in all things you would find us as faithful stewards for what we have been given, what we have been entrusted to. Lord, we celebrate the answered prayer. We celebrate for your hand in transforming lives. But Lord, we desire more healing, more miracles for those who are facing difficult medical situations where doctors have no answer. We know you're the great physician. And if you only say the word, there is healing. And Lord, beyond the physical Challenges. We know there's many with emotional issues and those who just suffer through the grief of the loss of life. We just pray for comfort. And those who've made a mess of the relationships that seem unfixable, Lord, we pray that you would intervene and bring reconciliation where there appears to be no way for those relationships to be healed. And in all things, Lord, that we may live fully in the moment taking advantage of every opportunity, living with a sense of purpose and urgency that we might be worthy to call ourselves children of the living God. And so for all the things, Lord, that you do here, for the variety of Bible studies and for the people who have a passion to draw closer to you, to study your word, to be faithful in prayer, Lord, that you might continue to order our steps and through all things that uh, we might know your presence. So we thank you for today, a day like none other that has ever existed, that we can be like-minded and united as we gather here and pray in the words that our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who
God of mercy and healing, you hear, you hear our cries and you take our petitions. Lord, bless and use our prayers and our presence and our gifts and our service and our witness to bring glory to you so that all the people that are troubled may know your peace, know your comfort, and know your courage. Amen.
He's a leader in the church in Jerusalem. Uh, James was also uh, a non-believer of his brother while Jesus was alive. He did not become a believer until after the resurrection, <coughs> which is the case for all of us now. So I think his example is as long as somebody is breathing, as long as there's still life in them, there is still the hope of salvation that the Lord waits with open arms. And you see what happened in James' life. And what I love so much about this epistle is how practical it is. You know, a lot of times in the church, you know, I, I get a lot of the same very difficult theological questions that come up. And they're pretty common about why, you know, uh, evil occurs and bad things happen to good people and, and so many folks lose their life at too early a stage and, and there's struggles people have with the Old Testament and understanding why it looks like. It appears as though, you know, God can be a wrathful God and, and how we balance that with grace and and yet I think a lot of times when we look at some of these more complex issues about the return of the Lord and what the book of Revelation means and the timing of that and whether you're a pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, is that it allows us in this discussion and conversation to kind of lose focus on what matters here and now and that has everything to do with me and you as individuals and as a community and James brings this so home, and it's so practical. And so last week, and James was, he gives us our instruction in how we're, we're to live with one another and, and how we guide, nurture, encourage one another. And his, and his teaching was, you know, just be quick to listen and slow to speak. And the idea is, I, I want to be, I want to understand before I'm worried about being understood. And he said, oh, by the way, you know, do not be just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, so you don't deceive yourselves. He said, be slow to anger. All these very practical applications. And so now, I'm going to pick this up. And if you have not read over the book of James, often I would encourage you to do so. I'm going to read from chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. There's room for notes on the back of your bulletin. I would encourage you to take those. Yep, Tom. James writes, he says, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, Will you stand there? Or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who love him. But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you in the court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. 
But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Now if you haven't underlined that verse in your Bible, I would encourage you to do so. James chapter 2 verse 10, he says, Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So the, the thing is why, why James, this, this book really gets under your skin, is because, by the way, these are not suggestions. It's not, hey, i got a good idea for you, treat people the same. This, this is a command. And the thing is, understand that, you know, we're not called to be Christian converts. I think we hear that a lot, you know, we have conversion experiences. Well, conversion experiences are fine, and we do altar calls where people decide to accept Christ, or they come forward and make a profession of faith, they get baptized. That's all good, but our mission is not making converts. Our mission is making disciples. And to make a disciple, you have to be a disciple. And to be a disciple is pretty clear. What it means is to learn from somebody. If you're the disciple, you're a student. But more clearly, you're a follower. So for us, our, our faith is actually pretty simple. We complicate it. And by the way, when, when we get off on these, these theological debates and arguments and try to sort things out, I think it's a defensive mechanism. And what I mean is the, the best defense is a good offense. And so if I don't want to deal with the convicting nature of Scripture, what do I want to do? If I can argue about the finer points of the law, and if I can make a case this is confusing, well, then I have to follow it. And then James cuts right through it and says, don't show favoritism. If you treat anybody differently because of what they have or what they don't have, you're shown as a lawbreaker. Oh yeah, and by the way, all these other sins are horrible. These things we know, murder and adultery. But if you fall short on the least part of the law, you're guilty of breaking all of it. Now, now let me correct something here. There's this mistaken belief I hear people repeat. They say, well, all sin is the same. Oh, oh heck no, it's not. Of course not. Of course it's not the same. There's, 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 there's some sins that are heinous or some sins that, that, that go on for generations. They're not all the same. The consequence is the same. And that is, if we make an error in the least little thing, what it means is, as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, the standard is your pastor. No, it's not. The standard is Jesus. <laughs> And it's the same way, it's a, you know, and so it's, it's, a, it's a standard where if we fail on the least level of the test, then our test score is a zero. There's not a minus, there's not a B, it's either pass or fail. So look at it this way. If we were going into an operating room, a sterile environment, and we know they're going, you've got you to scrub your hands down real good, right? And, and, and then you've got you to put on, on special gloves and you've got to put on a mask. So, you know, you, you make sure your shoes are covered. You need to be as sterile as possible, right? So the least little thing, if, you're, if your shoes have not been properly covered or you didn't scrub enough, then you would not be allowed within that operating room, right? Just like the person who's been out in the middle of the trash heap throwing the junk out, who's filthy from head to toe, they're disqualified from that sterile environment just like you, who's 99% clean. You're both disqualified. So what James is saying is, if you stumble on the least part of the law, you might as well have broken all of it. You get a zero. And he says, you know, these minor things we don't worry about are major in the eyes of the Lord. 
who shows no favoritism. Let me tell you, there, there are a few things as heinous, few things as unacceptable in the Christian faith as any sort of prejudice. It's abhorrent to God, and it should be to us. But the problem is, it's you know, sort of our nature, but it's not just our nature. We didn't, we didn't learn to be judgmental or prejudiced or war. We didn't, it is so rooted. It's not just human nature. Jordan Peterson, who's now become a very well-known political psychologist, and he's a professor in Canada. He's got a best-selling book out, 12 Rules for Life. And his first rule, what he talks about is understanding is how we have these hierarchies, right? It's like tribalism, and it's like my group, my people, and, and how we use the gifts we have. We use our power to, to lord over others, right? We use it to take advantage of ourselves, but you see, that's not human nature at all. Matter of fact, it, it is so ingrained in all nature, he uses the example of lobsters. And, and lobsters are like these very basic, you know, lobsters have about the simplest brainstem, brain patterns, and, and even within this very basic brain structure, lobsters have like ten different defined hierarchies. <laughs> and, and so, so the, 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 the king lobsters, guess what? You know, the, the, on the top of this list, they get the best little space, so they protect themselves, and, they, and they're surrounded by their friends, and they have the most influence, and, and, and the lobsters at the top of the lobster list they have the best chance of survival, and they lord over the ones in the second, third, fourth tier. Well, the ones on the tenth tier at the very bottom, well, they're abused by everyone. So he uses this example to say, you know, what happens is that, that when we take advantage of others, when we create this hierarchy, and then the ones in, in this lower this system that, that we are prejudiced against, the ones that, that we take advantage of, that get stopped on, those are the ones who get most bullied because you can get away with it. So it's not just human nature. Matter of fact, another sermon for another day, but when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, it wasn't just human nature that became sinful. Everything in creation became fouled up. Creation itself, the earth, sun, moon, and stars corrupt, suffering from decay. And so not just man, but even the lobsters had this hierarchy. And so his disciples of Jesus Christ says is, we follow him, we just do what he did. By the way, Jesus, who came for the lost, he came for the sick, he was the king at the very top here, said he did not come to be served but to take care of those. And our problem is fighting against those things that are selfish, fighting against those things that I think do me a favor, and as a result, man, you know, yeah, I enjoy name dropping. I enjoy pointing out those people I know who are special, who I'm connected to, the, the people who have invited me to their home, the people that, that uh, have either sort of special gifts or talents or... or uh, have carved out a nice life for themselves. Boy, I love to point out my connection to them. It's human nature. It's not Christ's nature. And so the people that we want to sit with, the people that we have meet and greet, who, who do you say hello to? Who are you immediately attracted to? We invite people to go, who do you invite to lunch? If you go to the hospital, if somebody's going to the hospital, you hear, who are you immediately going to run to go to the hospital and go sit? Well, typically the ones you're either friends with or, or, or folks that, that you're impressed with or folks that, that you want to somehow be affiliated to or, or have them and somehow want to do a favor for you. And James says, oh no. Oh no. Not in God's kingdom. Matter of fact, Jesus so relates to the downtrodden. He so relates to those who, who are at that, that bottom level there. He says, you know, when you visit the sick, when you visit, says, you're not visiting, you're visiting me. And when you go to prison and visit those in prison, you're visiting me. He so relates to them, he said, it's like being me. And so within the church, the question is, is how often are we drawing, attracting people because folks are hurting and lonely and feel judged because so much in our lives is conditional. What I have and what I've done and the gifts I bring and you're, you're surrounded by you know, people who, who want to be around you and, and somehow, right? Somehow, mutually beneficial 
not that way in the church. It's not human nature, it's not even nature. But listen, we're called to participate in the divine nature. We're called to be a part of the supernatural. It's a choice. We, we make a decision. You know, you may not enjoy visiting a hospital. It, it's not a pleasant thing to do. Go anyway. You, you, you know, it may be people that you're eager to make a meal for. I mean, let me ask this. Who, when you see a phone call coming in, whose calls do you not answer? Because you don't want to talk to them. How many people would send you a text? You don't reply because you, you don't... You don't want to be in touch with them. And, and how many others you see you're eager to be in touch with? We're showing favoritism. James says, by the way, when you're guilty of such things, it's like you've broken all the law. And so this very practical application which so resonates, it's our opportunity. <coughs> I don't know why there, there's, there's so much evil in the world. I don't know why there's so much sickness. Why I don't know why good people die so young, but, I, but this much I do know. For all the disaster, tragedy, all the sad things that happen in life, I don't know why, but I'll tell you what, it gives me an opportunity to then show what I believe. So for the folks that are on the, the bottom end, you, you know, while my, my heart may break over that, it gives me an opportunity not to show them who I am, but to show me the God who I worship and who I follow. And so the key for me then, the key for us, it's not doing what I know I'm supposed to do. It's not doing what I think is right. All it is as a follower of Christ is keeping my eyes on Him and seeing what He's doing and follow Him. That's what ministry is. It's His ministry. He invites us to participate. And you know what He does? He shows mercy. <laughs> he shows mercy. And by the way, what mercy means is those in mercy, who's somebody who's indebted to you somehow. Somebody you have some power over. Mercy means you, you let it go. It's forgiveness. And because we have been shown mercy, now the Lord says, do the same. And look at it this way. It's, uh, imagine if you had a child who was uh, graduated from college, had a job across the country, and they'd never been away from home before, and you're you're worried about their comfort level, whether they have any friends over there. So they're going across the country. You know somebody that lives over in that city. And so you say, hey, you know, I've got, uh, you know, my son's coming out there getting a job. Would you mind, you know, would you mind at least uh, reaching out to him and you know, making him feel welcome? And so you'd feel good if your friend reached out and, and invited your child in the home, maybe prepared a meal or let him stay there for a night or two or even show you around town. You'd be grateful. But then again, if your child is, is handsome and smart and articulate and, and gifted in every way, and the type of person everybody wants to be around, if your child is one who is voted most likely to succeed, and in a way you're doing your friend a blessing by allowing them to be exposed to your awesome child, <laughs> you'd still be grateful, right? But imagine, imagine if you had another child who had none of those attributes, who struggled all through life, who had a difficult time getting through school, was socially so awkward, and rarely made any friends, and, and, and acted out some ways, and had substance abuse issues, and just been in trouble, and now they're going out for the first time in their lives, and they're nervous and vulnerable, and you told your friend, if you would do me a favor, and if you reach out to my child, and, and if you found out that friend didn't just invite your son to come and have dinner, or didn't just invite them to come and stay in the home, but really took your son under their wing and drove them around town and introduced them and supported them in every way, went above and beyond. Would your heart not be filled with joy? Would you, would you, not, would you not just rejoice in that friendship? What do you think the Lord is going to do when we treat people that society said, you go down there with a the worthless lobster. What do you think the Lord is going to think when that person who can't pay us back? So let me ask, who do you sit with? Whose calls do you answer? Who do you invite over because it makes you feel good about yourself to have them in your presence? Forget them. Invite the ones nobody wants. Because the Lord does. And He's a miracle worker. 
And if we prove we belong to Him, we got to do what He does. That's why people reject the church. We look like the world. Hey, somebody's got a, a gold ring. If I, hey, come on in. Hey, sit up front. Man, i got a committee for you to serve on. you got gifts and talents. Right? The world looks at this, and the world that is in suffering and pain and desperately wants to be loved unconditionally, and we do not know what that means. There's a lot of hurt folks out there. You see stories last week, there's a couple of high-profile suicides. And, and, and the kind of people that we look at their lives, and there's their charm lives, right? There's people that are rich and famous and, 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 and have friends with flooding in, inviting them to all the, all the best parties and events and, and celebrating. And somehow don't think life is worth living anymore. How could that be? You know, my favorite story is about uh, <clears throat> Andy Burbank, who <coughs> lost his life this past week. I love there's a story. There's an a eight-year-old woman from North Dakota who worked for a little newspaper. I love her already. <laughs> That's about the average age of the reader is his age. But anyway, <laughs> worked for this little newspaper in North Carolina, I mean, North Dakota, and a new restaurant came to town. And she does restaurant reviews. Well, the restaurant was Olive Garden. Okay, so it comes down. So she goes and, and does a review of the uh, local Olive Garden. Talks about how lovely the decor was and, and how good the food was and the staff. So she writes this review about the new restaurant. And guess what? Mercilessly mocked. And you know why? It's not social media. It's anti-social media. There's nothing social about it. It's antisocial. So anyway, this, this eight-year-old woman writes a review about this new restaurant, Olive Garden Gushes, and it's just mocked coast to coast. Oh, you know, what, what a... Uh, you know, what a small, small perspective that, that you, would, you would think there's something possibly worth at an Olive Garden. How dare you? How unsophisticated. Like, you know. Well, you know, if you live in New York or L.A. and Atlanta, Olive Garden, I guess it's not that, that big a deal. Not that big a deal. But if you live in a small little town in North Dakota, <coughs> that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? But what the heck? What's, what's going to get in the way of us ridiculing somebody or mocking somebody you've never met? So, you know, it's coast to coast, anti-social media, just, just making a laughing stock, and Anthony Burbank called her up and invited her to come to York and told her how much he appreciated what you were in, and her appreciation for good food, and a good place. And actually, they collaborated on a book together. Now, he was going to get nothing out of their relationship. He wasn't going to benefit whatsoever. He didn't need to do anything for her. She was pushed down in that, in that little lower tier that, that nobody cares to reach out to. But he did. It made a difference in her life. I don't know what you have planned today. You can make a difference in somebody's life. I don't know how many neighbors got you all hang out with and like and do things. There's other neighbors in the street probably nobody talks to. There's probably neighbors that you never see coming out of their house. We're surrounded by people that have so few connections. They don't know what they have to live for. I got something they can live for. A meaning and purpose in following Jesus Christ who doesn't challenge us as a group, but each individual, he says, what about you? What about you? I don't have the answer for me. Actually, I've got an answer for the church as well, but that's I, I take that seriously as well. But if we worry about things, and these questions come up, it's like, well, what about the people never heard of Jesus? What about the people on the island that never had a missionary? And, and I feel like Jesus says, I'll take care of them. What about you? So before I worry about what my brother or sister does or doesn't do, before I worry about how they treat others and fair or unfair, I get to deal with me. And as a follower and disciple of Jesus Christ, the real simple question is, am I doing what he did? Do I do what he is still doing? And I'll tell you, well, you, can, you can struggle through Scripture trying to figure out, but I'll tell you what, a lot of this is really clear, really plain and simple. Here's the thing. You may be confused by what you've read or haven't read. 
I'll, here's a little hint I'll give you. If you'll be faithful to what you do know, if you'll be faithful to what's really clear, and just do that part, the Lord will give you more. Love your neighbor yourself. And by the way, sort of the good Samaritan, you know who your neighbor is? The, the guy laying down on the ground, you know, the guy who can't do you any good at all. The, the guy's not going to help you, and, and that's, that's, that's our neighbor. Because all we're called to do is what the Lord has done and is doing. He loves the unlovable. He forgives the unforgivable. And His promises that mercy triumphs over judgment. We've been shown mercy. All we need to go out there is show some ourselves. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your patience, Lord. I thank you that, that you forgive when we don't deserve it. Lord, may we, uh, may we faithfully follow you in all we do, that we may truly be children of the living God and turn this world upside down through love and grace. Verse Tom. <clears throat> <clears throat>